Hello and welcome back to another episode of It's Always Sunny in Heaven or Hell, depending on how you look at it. Uh, and today uh, we're going to be heading into some different territory. We're going to be talking about Christian movies by one man, Rich Cristiano. Uh, I am your host, Lugia, and these two are... My name is Patrick, and to quote the great Hosier, I'll tell you my sins while you sharpen your knife. Uh, they call me drum arts. I don't know much about the Bible, except, um, you know, the, the stories. Yeah, I, like, I know the stories in the Bible, but, like, I, I don't know, like... It's also kind of funny that uh, your profile pic is uh, The Thing, but Jewish. It's not but Jewish. The Thing is Jewish. Like, the character. It's, like, a very key part of his character. <laughs> it's not, like, a joke. It's... For some reason, the Fantastic Four movies always just kind of, like, ignore this, but, like, like, the thing being Jewish is, like, a pretty big part of his character. <laughs> like, I feel like, um, the fucking Spider-Man movies, like, imply that Peter Parker is, Ju is more Jewish than the actual Jewish, like, superheroes, <laughs> which is kind of funny to me. Peter Parker's Jewish? In some versions, he's Jewish. I actually didn't know that. Um, in, the Raimi, in the Raimi universe and into the spider Verse, I think they imply he's Jewish or not because they also kind of imply that Aunt May is Christian, so I'm not sure, but they imply he's Jewish in some stuff. Uh, before we really get into religion, uh, I think so. let's take a minute. Wait, uh, hey, what, Ron? Like, what? like, might as well. Yeah, I don't know. Go on. Yeah, sure. Uh, let's take a minute to pay our respects to the late William Bill Post. He passed away this past week at the age of 96, and he is best known as being the creator of the Pop-Tart. And yes. serious question for you guys, when's the last time you had a Pop-Tart? Years ago. I think the last one I had was like a s'mores Pop-Tart, and that was like in 2015. Uh, I had it like a month ago, because um, I think I was... Whenever I last visited my parents, that's when I last had a pop tart because my dad has pop tarts, and I think I, my dad always keeps like cinnamon pop tarts, and I think like one day I was just like I was kind of wanted a snack, so I grabbed one. I think I got one when I was like when I was still in school last year. I think I was just hungry, and I got some from the vending machine. Otherwise, I don't remember the last time I had a toasted pop tart. I saw um. A TikTok like a day ago where some guy's like, What's your favorite Pop Tart flavor? And he was like, Strawberry. And then he called him like a bitch um, because, like, it's such a basic choice. It's like the default Pop Tart. And he was like, Fine, you want to know what my actual favorite is? And he like names like this exclusive, like, Spider Man Pop Tart they made in like 2002 to tie into the movie. And he was like, What? <laughs> Why are your only two favorite Pop Tart flavors this like obscure movie tie in flavor? And, um, Another serious question. You guys remember the iconic Crazy Good Pop-Tart commercials from the 2000s? Yeah, those always bothered me. Like, Hi. I liked them, but um, they bothered me because it was a case of blatant plagiarism from, like, a smaller artist. Uh, are you guys familiar with Don Hertzfeld? Mm -hmm. Maybe. The name sounds Basically, familiar. So Don Hertzfeld is this um, independent animator. He's probably, like, one of the more famous independent animators because... Um, for the most part, people are like at least somewhat familiar with a little bit of his work, mostly because of um his first short film called Rejected. And Rejected was a bunch of fake ads he made that had like a very sketch comedy vibe, and it was very influential on the internet. It was one of the first like viral videos on the internet, and um it would later go on to inspire uh the Laser Collection and Asdaf movie. They were all kind of riffing on that humor kind of thing. But then, you know, there's some legal issues because the Pop Tarts uh, crazy good commercials basically just ripped off rejected and at least like don hertzfeld's kind of like humor and art style like i don't know if you look up like a, a don hertzfeld cartoon and then a pop tart crazy good ad you'll like definitely see that they're the same so yeah i think uh i think there was some like legal issue there once i like actually tweeted out there's like as a kid i thought that like um it was uh I, I, I tweeted out like you know there was like i had no idea that you know pop tarts ripped them off and don hertzfeld actually liked and replied to my tweet so, like, yeah, they, they definitely ripped him off, because... Hey, now that's a lame claim to fame. Like, I basically got, like, confirmation from him, because, like, he responded. Like, and he was like, yeah, they, they kind of ripped me off. I was like, oh, shit. Well, anyway, Lugia, do you remember those commercials? I, I... I don't remember them, to be honest. You at least remember the crazy good. 
That was Pop Tarts. I thought that was something else. Yeah. No, um, cinnamon, cinnamon Toast Crunch kind of ripped them off. Yeah, too. I was, was thinking like, of Cinnamon yeah. Toast Crunch. Like that was yeah. Pop Tarts, though. No, that w no Pop Cinnamon Pop Toast Crunch was. Pop Tarts did it first because the the Pop Tarts things were a similar thing of like people wanting to kill and hunt the Pop Tarts and like that a few guys with Pop Tarts were eating each other. Um, and then Cinnamon Toast Crunch later down the line kind of had like a similar thing. They like try to combine like the rabbits with the Pop Tarts thing, or like the minions with well, the Pop Tarts thing. I ask if you guys remember those old commercials because. I was watching the Super Bowl last weekend, and a Pop Tart commercial came up. It was two Pop Tarts in a vending machine, talking about how much they wanted to be eaten. And I'm like, wait a minute, that's not Pop Tarts lore. The Pop Tarts were trying to avoid being eaten. No, they changed it like around Come on. halfway through. The, the I know, campaign. I know. I'm just joking. I'm just joking. I'm like, you're changing the lore. No. Wait, is, what yeah, happened? and that's um, I don't know. I don't know. Well, yeah. well, speaking of mascots, going back to Cinnamon Toast Crunch, do you guys remember the mascot used to be like this baker? Yeah, I do remember that. No. I do. I remember I that just because it was I don't on remember the, box. the commercials. I just I, remember he was always I, on the box. Yeah, I never saw a Cinnamon Toast Crunch commercial before the uh, the cannibal stuff. Um, kind of like... like I don't think cookie, I did either. Like, do you remember Cookie Crisp? Yes, I remember. I remember Cookie, cookie Crisp, crisp the, yeah. Yeah. It was did the you, dog and then it was the wolf. Yeah, they, they had like a bunch. They had like a Cops and Robbers. They had a Wizard. Those commercials are actually like some of my favorite commercials because they were genuinely just Looney Tunes shorts that advertise food. It was great. The Cookie Crisp Wolf cartoons, I think, is like that's the true successor to Wiley e. Coyote because like they were just Wiley e. Coyote cartoons, but with a cookie motif, and that's it. And then I think uh, the Cops and Robbers ones, those were basically like Pink Panther Spy vs. Spy cartoons. I don't even think they had a cookie motif. I don't know what the they just, like, played a cartoon, and then at the end said, buy our cereal. And I was like, huh? Okay, sure. Here's a serious oh, question. You guys remember the Honeycombs mascot? Whatever the hell that thing was? The, I don't. The frog with the backwards hat? No, no, that's... Oh, wait, no, that's, that, that's, honeycomb. that's Honey Smacks. Yeah, that's Honey Smack. No, uh, the Honeycomb thing was, like, this crazy, like, hedgehog or porcupine or whatever. I don't remember that at all. And it just, it just, it just constantly craved honeycombs. It, I don't even know what it was, but it was this weird, hairy monster of some kind. I the do, ones I'm looking at it. I do not I remember this remember, thing. The ones I remember really liking as a kid, um, besides the Trix Rival one, because I feel like the Trix one is just kind of like iconic. But um, the the one after that was uh, the Apple Jackson Cinnamon stuff, where they were uh, like always like on a race. Those are like. Really good, and like the cinnamon stick was Jamaican for some reason. Remember those? I I remember that. Yes, yes, yes. The Winamon. Yeah, and um, they had like a they had like this like whole kind of like almost like Toy Story type lore thing with uh this isn't cereal but it's, um goldfish. Like they had like a ton of lore with goldfish stuff. That was like crazy. It was like an extended universe with characters. There was like the M and M commercials almost were like they were like characters and stuff. I remember the I Fruit Loops that. commercials had, like, an ongoing story about the toucan and his nephews, like, going hunting yeah. for treasure. Yeah, basically. And, like, each uh, commercial bled into the next. Yeah. I thought that was cool. I, I don't know, remember if you remember this, but there was, like, a brief period of time where Lucky Charms tried to have, like, an almost fantasy epic thing going on with the Lucky Charms guy. Where, like, like some of them were just simple, but, like, a lot of them was more of, like, like, they're, like they kind of had, like, a dark, almost, like, Lord of the Rings type feel to it. It was, like... I was like, this is kind of cool, honestly. It was weird, but I was like, yeah. I didn't last don't long. remember. I distinctly remember it because um, they actually encouraged you to go to their website to see more clips. And I was like, fuck yeah. So I remember going onto their website to see more clips. Was it a case like Goldfish where you could uh, submit your uh, story for what happens next? It might have been, yeah. I can't remember. It was like a game where like you could kind of like choose. 2000 cereal commercials were like, surprisingly good. And, you know, you... you I already mentioned how I think, like, the Cookie Crisp ones were just, like, the successor to Wile E. Coyote, but, like, if we're being real, the Toucan Sam ones, th those are, like, DuckTales, basically. Like, you basically got, like, basically. Maybe, like DuckTales short, or, like, um, each one kind of, like, reminded me of something. Like, uh, the race, most of them were, like, a classic kind of, like, two-person, you know, comedy duo thing. Like, the Trix Rabbit and the Cookie Crisp ones, they were kind of similar with, like, the, you know, trying to get something and then, you know, them getting punked. And then, um... Yeah, they had just, like, the very classic, like, two-person cartoon dynamic gag. And um, I'm just saying, 
Food Fight, if they just focused on serial mascots, Food Fight could have actually been a pretty decent Roger Rabbit riff. That's the movie police out to get you. Yeah. It was like, Food I Fight, it was nothing. like, Ooh, someone is saying that they'd like to see Food Fight. I was like, oh, I'm kidding, I'm kidding. Imagine I'm talking right. positively food... about Food Fight. Speaking of Food Fight, uh, okay, this is... This is just something kind of funny. Um, you guys remember? Do you guys remember the old Mr. Clean commercials? Oh yeah, shoot! I completely forgot about. Uh, those. what do you mean by the old ones? Yeah. People like their like their house is dirty, and they have like a Mr. Clean product, and Mr. Clean comes in and just cleans the house. Yeah, like nothing too crazy. But I bring that up because I remember as a kid, like I saw Mr. Clean just come up to this normal family's house, and I always thought Mr. Clean products worked, or if you just buy the product and open it, he would show up. Why I was not just like, call so him? Mr. I was always like, so when's Mr. Clean going to be here? I was a, I was a pretty like, dumb kid. He's like, he's like Santa Claus. He only shows up when you're asleep. I, I never liked Mr. Clean just because, like, he was just a bald guy and always just kind of, like, threw me off. Like, 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 I have nothing against bald, but, like, it's just weird that he, he's just, like, a grown man. Like, he's just a guy. Like, that's the mascot, just a guy. A bald guy. <laughs> was like, he's got a clean head. But yeah, clearly, clearly, I liked uh, the some of the more mean spirited ones, you know, like the Cookie Crisp and like the Tricks one, because those are just like funny, and I like the magical ones. Um, I don't know, people are probably gonna kill me for this. I never care for Tony the Tiger. Really? Yeah, because like all of his commercials were just like PSAs, and it was like kind of lame, like whatever. Um, I really like the Cheetos guy, not because like I like Cheetos, but because um, I don't remember like. If you guys saw these, but um, the guy who made cow and chicken made a bunch of like Cheetos commercials, and it was like it was very clear like proto cow and chicken. I was like, oh, these are they, those are like so good. I was like, hell yeah, dude. Um, let's see, one more mascot. I was trying to remember. It was uh, are you limiting not, it not... to cereal mascots or like just mascots? Oh, just like in it was in general. It was cool. And I brought up Mr. Fun. Clean. Mr. Clean's not a cereal. What the fuck yeah. is the deal with the tricks rabbit? Oh, tricks are for kids. I like how they always kind of imply that he was like an addict, and like I, I like those, I like the the shorts where like he had his like his grandpa that was actively like preying on the fact that he was addicted. They're like Scooby snacks, but like higher dosage. There is one Trix commercial from like forty years ago where he actually gets the cereal. I always remembered um the Family Guy parodies of the Trix ones because I, I feel like. The Trix Rabbit, I honestly feel like, is like probably one of the more iconic ones because I feel like everyone still remembers Tricks are for Kids and like they still kind of air those commercials. Where like, even though I think the Cookie Crisp guy made like, well, had the best commercials, I feel like not many people are as familiar with Cookie Crisp as they are with Trix and Lucky Charms and stuff. The Lucky Charms guy was kind of a reversal because it was people trying to hunt him down and he was like, Good lord, I just want to live my life. You'll never get me charms. Like, You'll never get me charms. It's like, why are you trying to imprison me? And like, and like, you only want like the marshmallow reverse. bits anyway. <laughs> Actually, that brings up. I remember there was a, a a Cartoon Network Mad sketch where it showed the brother of of the leprechaun who had like the actual cereal bits, and he's like, "I have so many of these. Nobody ever wants to take them." Oh my god, I remember that. Yes. I do remember that one. Yeah. I'm the only reason this is a breakfast cereal. <laughs> 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 great. Oh, the always underappreciated brother god i'm just gonna actually look it up now just because like i mean we start off on pop tarts that was even cereal but like yeah pop tarts and then fucking cinnamon toast crunch which were like like um like if minions or rabbits were like actually funny i still th like the cinnamon toast crunch ones I actually think are pretty funny because they were like you guys ever read that book uh bunny suicides what oh my god yes i that, that was like you just pulled like like a, a memory out of my head. I've like, never heard a of it. memory. Okay, so Bunny Suicide I remember Suicide flipping through like... that at like Barnes and Noble once, and I was never able to find it again. And I'm like, oh yeah, yeah. that book. So yeah, so Bunny Suicides is basically like these. It's these one panel comics that are like basically like you basically see um these rabbits like they set up like a Rube Goldberg machine to kill themselves, and they were kind of like like Wile E. Coyote type Looney Tunes cartoons, but like um with self harm. <laughs> it was like it was pretty funny. So they were pretty creative, but like, yeah, the cinnamon toast crunch commercials always kind of like reminded me of those. It was like, except it's cannibalism. Was, yeah, cannibalism, and this one is just more of self harm. It remind you remember the rabbit from Igor, that cartoon Igor, 
Does anyone remember Igor? Yeah. <laughs> animated that animated movie. Uh, Patrick, we saw that movie multiple times in theaters, so I, I expect you to remember it. I only remember seeing that movie with you once. I know I saw it more than once in theaters. And... I've, I saw it twice, but once was with my grandparents, and once was with you. I do not remember seeing it ever again after that. I think it, it was like you and me alone, and then like another time we had like other friends, so it was like, it was weird. I've, I, I know I saw a B-movie multiple times in theaters too, like similar deal. Because, uh, can you guys hear the alarm, by the way? I saw a yeah. B-movie once with a different friend. I saw, like, B-movie alone, then a friend invited me, then another friend invited me, and I was like, man, I, I can't get enough of this guy. <laughs> like, Jesus. I saw Jerry Seinfeld B so many times in my life, especially because it used to play on DVD all the time. Like, I feel like everyone played, had, had like, a DVD of B-movie, and they play. I had a DVD of B-movie. I played it multiple times. I've seen that movie more times than I've seen most movies. So, um, do we actually get into the... I don't even, yeah. I don't even have a clever way I to transition I don't know, man. I was enjoying our no, mascot no, talk. <laughs> We're no yeah, longer... but oh wait, wait! I got a transition. Okay, instead of talking about the crucif the crucifixion of the uh, Lucky Charms mascot today, we're gonna be talking about the crucifixion of uh, the Lord and Savior. Oh shit! I just remember Cocoa Puffs. What was the difference between Cocoa Puffs and Tricks? They were like the same commercials. Cocoa oh! Puffs was actively trying to avoid the cereal, but it always found oh! him. Ah, that's where I got confused. Okay, I was like, I, it was Cocoa Puffs where he was addicted to crack. And, like, his grandpa was, like, actively, like, goading him. No, around. no, it's yeah, just, no, just... no. Tricks was, he was trying to get the stuff, but never could. Yeah, Tricks was him trying to, like, trick get away from it. The Tricks Bunny Tricks was, was trying to withdraw. Tricks was just no. classic Tom and Jerry shit. Tricks was just classic Tom and Jerry shit. He was just trying to get these cereal, and then, uh, he never would. It was, like, um, Scrat from Ice Age, where, like, he was so desperately trying to get it, and then he... But the Cocoa never... Puss bird is trying to withdraw from it. And, uh, yeah, the and... Cocoa Puffs bird is, is, has had his life ruined due to his crippling addiction to chocolate. I remember there was also, a commercial where he was in court trying to explain himself. <laughs> Here's one that I feel like... I'm, I'm, I'm being serious. <laughs> how many people do you think have actually seen a Flintstones cartoon, and how many just have seen the ads? I mean, I used to watch like, Boomerang when I was a kid, so, yeah, so like, I know what I know, Flintstones I know is. We... I know we've actually seen the Flintstones TV show because we're weird, but like, I wonder like if normal people actually like, like if like I if I like talk to like a random person on the street, like they'll be like, oh yeah, the Flintstones, I've seen those commercials, and they're they're like, well that All depends. Right, like, would they show. air the Flintstone serial commercials on anything outside of Cartoon Network? Yeah. Okay, then like most likely then Disney probably. The um the Flintstones commercials. Like, also, everyone has, like, Flintstone gummies, and I know, um, for a while, a lot of people would, online used to share the Flintstone cigarette commercials. It was like, hey, Bonnie, I'm smoking a pack of Newports. It's toasted, not, uh, Lucky Strikes, is, it's toasted. Whatever, one of those two. Oh, oh, fuck. Uh, I think it was Winston. Yeah, Winston. It was Winston's, right, yeah. Winston tastes good like a cigarette should. I really like the um the Jim Henson coffee commercials. Have you guys ever seen those? I haven't, but that I... just reminds me of another commercial I saw. Okay, I can't say I'm there, familiar. So, so Jim Henson uh has like there was like hours of compilations of this where he like um he used to have like these like thirty second commercials. And this was before the Muppets. This was like when he was just starting out. But he used to have these thirty second commercials that were like advertising coffee, and like. Almost all of them was like basically a dude be like, I don't like coffee. And then um the this Kermit the Frog looking guy uh then brutally murders him. Like there's this one where he, like some guy's like, I don't like Winston coffee. So then Kermit shoots him and then he points the gun to the camera and was like, Do you like Winston coffee? And I was like, Jesus. It was like it's kinda weird. Like, oh I yes, like yes, I do know those classic commercials. They were in black and white, right? Some of them were black and white. Yes, yeah, I've color. seen some, those. Some I've seen color. those. Yeah. I've and seen like, the black and white ones. Like, kind of dark Jim Henson's humor is. Like, for, like, being, like, a, a children's commercial guy, he was, like, he kind of had, like, a sixth sense of humor. Yeah, I can't believe it. he was going to commit a crime over coffee. That's a sin. The The evolution of Kermit is really interesting because his character actually, like, changed, like, quite a bit. Um, He was kind of a dick before the, 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 the Muppets. Like, he was just an asshole. And even on Sesame Street, he would be, like, kind of an asshole. But, like, a nicer asshole. Um, and then, like, once the Muppet Show actually formed, then, like, they solidified his character as, um, him not being, as him being more, like, 
him being snippy isn't him just being a prick. It's like him being so stressed because he's trying to keep a show that's barely functioning together. So like, the, the, it kind of changed it a bit. Mickey Mouse should be like a mix of Kermit and SpongeBob, and instead, he's boring. Except for the Mortimer cartoons. The Mortimer cartoons are really funny because it's about um, I don't know if you've seen the first Mortimer shirt, but the the in t the first Mortimer shirt is basically like fucking Squilliam Fancy Pants coming in and trying to fuck Minnie. Just keeps getting owned. It's it's it's, liter it's literally just Mickey getting the shit beaten out of him because this dude keeps trying to fuck his girl. It's crazy. Like it's like, I'm I'm guessing I think this was like that was like during the production of Snow White. So like. Here's a trick I need to tell you guys. Almost every time Walt was busy working on something else, his the cart the Disney cartoons got like significantly better. So like all the funny like Goofy and Donald Duck cartoons that everyone knows that was during the fifties. Um, Walt was entirely focused on like the Disneyland and Epcot project then, so he did not supervise the cartoons. So they just like threw in random funny shit. It was great. Anyway, um, I guess uh, let's get out our let's get out our Bibles, children. Yeah, we we yeah. spent uh. <laughs> A longer than usual amount of time talking about mascots. Instead of being addicted to Cocoa Puffs, I'm addicted to Jesus. Oh lord. I don't okay. think I even said what movies we're talking about today. Uh you so, said start. Well, I said the director. I don't think I said the movies. Yeah. So actually wait, wait, wait. Two more comments. Just two more real quick, because I just remembered. We're never gonna get to them. <laughs> just one second. It's fine. <laughs> we don't have much to talk about, really. That even to begin with. It's called content. The lucky, not the lucky, the Honey Nut Cheerios commercials. What were those? Because I don't remember, but I remember that fucking bee. I remember that bee. The bee was basically, the bee was basically like a superhero because there were these criminals who always wanted to steal the honey for the Honey Nut Cheerios and he would use oh, right. honey to stop yeah. them. He would use and his like, honey stick. Okay. And I remember Reese's Puff was just, that was just hip hop. Like, eat did they have stuff before the Everyone knows the Reese's Puff's rap. Did they have stuff before the rap? Did they have stuff before I, the rap? I don't know. I don't remember Maybe. anything before the rap. I also remember a Danimal's Monkey, my favorite one. And I, Patrick, I don't know if you remember this, but I got uh, in a lot of trouble because of the Capri Sun commercials in school. But, um, in the, you did? They used to get, so they used to have these Capri Sun commercials where it's like, you blow up the pouch and then you step on it and then like you get cursed yes, by like yeah. a demonic entity. So yeah, um, one time mm -hmm. me and um, another guy, we basically played Russian roulette with a um, with a Capri Sun pouch where we would stomp on it, but it would have like juice and we'd all go like kind of play chicken. And at one point I was like, man, that's not a real stomp, pussy. So then I stomped on it and juice got all over the gym cafeteria that and that sounds got, like something you would do what's that supposed to be i was like hey, <laughs> man, wait, well yeah anyway um they i got in trouble i had to mop it up myself and then for the next week i think okay it was definitely fourth grade because uh i had to eat my lunch in my office and um we would just like talk yeah 2000s 2000s and 90s commercials are like elite those were like the best ones also, I don't know, when did they stop having Ronald McDonald? Because I remember Ronald McDonald being in, like, commercials, and then he just stopped. And I when, heard it was When did the boxes of... take over? Like, uh, 20, 2011, maybe? I completely forgot probably, about the boxes. Probably around the same time as the Minions, so that seems about right. I completely forgot about the boxes. Holy shit, yeah, the boxes. Yeah. It's kind of funny how the Minions is, like, so popular. When there was, like, three different versions of the Minions that predated the Minions, and I was like, why was the Minions the one that popped off uh so as i said earlier uh we are going to be looking at a couple movies by rich cristiano uh and yes. they are second glance and the appointment okay by the way um i don't know if you can like pull up a picture of rich cristiano but like i'm not crazy he looks like ray romano right or like ralph macchio yeah because like this man is definitely like he's got that like sicilian italian vibe that like slight tan kind of like me but like a little lighter. You know what I'm talking about, right? You guys have seen Italian people before. You, we, you live in a state with <laughs> I, a lot of them. I am Italian, so <laughs> yes, I have looked in a mirror. But yeah, you know how like some Italians have like a tan. He's like he he got like the same tan mm -hmm. as like Ray Romano and like Ralph Macchio. He's got that similar look. All right. Anyway, so uh, 
Not much is really known about Rich Cristiano. You try looking up his Wikipedia article and it says like he's a he's a filmmaker and he has a brother. These are his films. Have at it. Uh, even though we're only talking about two of his movies, he does have quite the repertoire. He's made about well, he's produced about 13 movies and his most recent one, Mind Reader, came out in uh, 2022. And it's also rated 9.2 stars on IMDb. So uh, good job, Rich. His brother's also a filmmaker, it looks like. Yeah. Yeah, and he released a movie last year. So the Cristiano brothers are two years ago doing good. They should collaborate like the Coens. Also, they're twins. Jesus. Okay, cool. So as for the movies themselves, uh, we're gonna be doing a little bit of a different approach with these since they're Christian movies. I think you kind of understand like what they're gonna be about. So we'll just lump them together and go from there. Let's start with uh, Second Glance right now. So Second Glance is the story of a boy named Daniel. And he lives in a Christian household and has Christian beliefs and he makes Christian friends. And one day, uh, a girl he really likes, Tamara, is going to a party with a bunch of bullies. And he wants to be a part of that party, but his uh, Christian values kind of get in the way of that. So one day he just wishes that he was a non-believer and an angel named Muriel grants him that wish and the rest of it just becomes it's a wonderful life. But if you change the names around. It's it's a wonderful life, but like with none of the actual themes of it's a wonderful life. Just the concept, or rather the last act of it's a wonderful I think, life. I think it's much more comparable to the iCarly parody of It's a Wonderful Life, or Shrek 4. So he learns that uh, his sister was never born, uh, a friend he saved before committed suicide because he wasn't there for him, he hangs out with the bullies, and he's just a really shitty person, and also cheats on his girlfriends, plural. What I never stood is how would his actions um, affect the existence of his sister? Well, that, d that didn't make sense to me. He was such a shitty kid that they just decided not to have more... <laughs> That's my theory. And then the rest just plays how you would expect it to. Like, he, he's not comfortable with this life anymore. He, he prays to have his normal life back, and it happens. And, he's, and then Muriel's like, this, keep doing the things that you're doing, Daniel. Be, be a good Christian man. All right, see you never. Enjoy watching uh, the movie that you're holding in your class, which is The Appointment. But like that, 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 that's literally what happens. Like on one of the posters in the school, they advertise the appointment, which is another one of Rich Cristiano's which films. Which you didn't notice until I pointed it out. Yeah, I was paying attention to like the where the room was located, like in marker, like on the bottom of the poster. And I was too, um, I was too amped up for the uh, the ending of the film because that was like right at the end of the movie, right? Like he that, passed that was, by it, and then he. Yes, it that twice. was the very end of the movie. I think Scotty so says it to end. Daniel at the beginning, and then at the end, like Daniel says it to Scotty. He's like, "Hey, Scotty, Jesus, man." By the way, um, just if any of you decide to pop in this movie, uh, some of you may actually recognize it, and that's because um, the ending of the film, the part I just quoted, the "Hey, Scotty, Jesus, man," that was a pretty viral meme, and like. In the mid 2010s, I remember seeing Ray William Johnson talk about it on Equals Three, and he would frequently talk about it, like constantly. It became a meme. It was like a running joke on his channel. It was kind of weird, but anyway, the appointment. All right, uh, th this one's gonna be much shorter. So, a woman named Liz is writing uh, articles for a newspaper company that basically slanders churches. So, an anonymous guy one day walks up to Liz's office and says, you're going to die on September 19th at 6.05 p.m. And they also... Eastern Standard uh, Time. The movie takes place on 9-11. Well, the movie starts on Tuesday, September 11th. And given this came out in 1991, I think it's safe to assume that's the year. So, we're like we said, we're just going to clump these two together because there's really not much to get talking about them individually so these are christian movies and i am not a religious person so my expectations going into these were like rock bottom but i was pleasantly surprised that at least from like a filmmaking and technical standpoint 
These are actually pretty competent. Like, the camera work, the music, even the acting, like, it's not bad. You can tell like, Rich has an especially... eye for filmmaking, yeah. Especially with the appointment, with the shots of the characters behind the blinds. I thought those were really cool. And to talk about the music, uh, both films had the same composer, Keith... I wrote it down. Keith, Keith... Keith Vivret. I probably butchered that last name, but whatever. And I was impressed because both films have very different scores. Because Second Glance has a very, like funky score. I'll admit, at the beginning, when his sister's walking in, the sister's walking into Daniel's room to mess with his alarm clock, and we got this, like, funky beat. I'll admit, I was, like, kind of tapping my foot. And we it get that like throughout. Black, so it's... It sounds like a black exploitation soundtrack. I think we just need to get that. It's, the opening of the movie sounds like Shaft. Like, you think that it's gonna be like, who's that sexy? Um... The appointment has is a completely different end of the spectrum, because it almost sounds like a horror movie score. Well, that's supposed so to match I, the tone. Would, it's supposed to be suspenseful. I but... know. But, like, you could put this in, like, like an actual horror film, and I think it would fit pretty well. So I was I was pretty impressed with the music. I still think it'd be really funny if the movie was, like, just, like, an actual black exploitation soundtrack. But, like, instead of talking about how, like, Shaft is the coolest, most badass motherfucker around, it's about Jesus. Like, who's the black private dick that's a sex machine to all the chicks? Christ, damn right. <laughs> oh, so yeah, like, when like, it came to, like, it the like, technicals Ooh. and, like, the general production values, I was like, you know what? This is competent. It's not amazing, but, again, given my low expectations, the fact that it actually looked like a finished product is a miracle, I guess. But... It reminds me of, like, those, like, not not a PSA or, like, a commercial, but, like, remember those, like, safety videos they used to show us in school? Like the, the Second the Glance campaigns. kind of had that look. Second Glance yeah, kind of had like, that look. The appointment kind of felt like a really low like, budget Twilight Zone episode. The appointment felt more like a real movie. Like that was actually better directed, which is weird because it came out before Second Glance. So like I don't know why his directing got worse, but like whatever. But uh, the big thing with both of these films, like we said, are Christian movies, and. Christian yeah, movies, really let's just say, happy. when making them, subtlety isn't exactly something they strive for. It doesn't always need subtlety. There is, like, a very operatic quality to a lot of, like, Christian stories, but I also feel like they kind of, like, it, it's weird where they, like, they approach it to material that doesn't have, like, the the enough weight to make it feel operatic. Here, like, I th you know, you think it almost gonna work because, like, it is riffing off It's a Wonderful Life, which is a very, like, kind of big, old Hollywood-type thing, but, like, I don't know, it just doesn't, just doesn't connect. Have I bet you guys seen Prince of Egypt? I have. Yeah. Obviously. Yeah, of course. I don't, hasn't. I don't know if it's, like, inherently a Christian film, but it does have a lot of Christian themes, and in comparison to these Jewish two, film. I guess, but, like, it doesn't really, like, hammer in its message or, like, beat you over the head with it. Like, it's just, just trying here's to tell the, a story of Moses, and it doesn't go Prince, too far, like... Here's the thing. Prince of Egypt is basically just, like, Hamlet. It's just, like, a classic kind of Shakespeare-type story. And, like, that's what I mean. It's got, like, that kind of, like, operatic quality. I feel like... And, like, it's an actual Bible story. Like, that's the thing. The Bible has a lot of very good stories in it, but they're all, like, Shakespearean. They all have that, like, classic operatic quality to it. Like, you know, almost like a Star Wars quality. But, like, um... This is trying to be like, this is trying to be like Full House mixed with like a Frank Capra movie, which like, Frank Capra does get kind of like operatic again, like in the actual It's a Wonderful Life, like it gets kind of heavy. It's got like a, you know, Christmas Carol kind of quality to it, but like, I don't know, they just don't, uh, they make it feel too low key, I guess. Like I, I want, like I feel like some people's criticism of like a lot of Christian stuff is like it's too on the nose, but I feel like it being on the nose isn't the issue. It's that like they don't actually like know how to like execute it in a way that like feels properly big. You know, to give other Christian movies like an example, um, The Last Temptation of Christ. You know, that movie feels huge. You know, they, they these they feel like epics. Like, you know, God's Not Dead is not a good movie, but like to give it some credit, they actually do try to make it feel like big. It's like from a filmic level, it's like it lands a bit better, but like here again, it just feels like I'm watching like a sitcom. It doesn't like have that oomph. Uh, Lugia, do you have anything to say about either? I find it interesting. 
uh, how the appointment is sort of set up and it's supposed to be suspenseful. Like, oh, like going in, if you understand how most Christian movies are and you watch the appointment, you'll think by the end, uh, Liz will like just open up a Bible and start reading it and start believing. But then Rich Cristiano plays the Uno reverse card and has her killed by an oncoming car. But it kind of doubles down on the fact that, like, oh, if you're a sinner, you're you're screwed. Fuck you. I listen. Do you know what I thought was really funny about that? That's like the exact same ending as the Sam Raimi horror movie "Drag Me to Hell." And I'm like, man, it's really funny that like, it's like it's funny that it has like, like there's that that commonality. Like, if you like the appointment, watch "Drag Me to Hell" by Sam Raimi because they're like they're not that different movies. It's basically about like some lady who does some shit and then he's getting punished by the devil for it, basically. Now, the appointment is canon to Second Glance's universe, and one of the characters, uh, I think his name was Doug, he is secretly praying to God every night, and Daniel invites him over for the viewing session of the appointment. Do you think he would have walked out like he said he would? I think he might have been intrigued. I mean, like, I was intrigued when it started. When it started? But when it kept going, what did you think? Uh, like I said, it kind of felt like a low-budget Twilight Zone episode. I'm like, all right, it's, it, it has a bit of a creepy atmosphere. I kind of dig. Because I thought it but got then a the little movie just stale. Kinda, the movie, but then the movie just kind of stops at one point just so a character could explain how awesome Christianity is. That goes on for like five minutes. And, I'm like, and okay, they, they I, talk I in a know. red room and he just keeps going on. They do. Have we talked about any other religious movies here besides Dogma? I don't think so. No, and I I avoid that can of worms. And it's hard to say if Dogma even counts. I'd say it counts. It's definitely has like some biblical allusions and whatnot. Yeah, it's more so poking oh. fun at it instead of just being a a straight Christian movie. Mm -hmm. it, it yes, definitely, but like it does it, it has much more prominent Christian themes than say like I don't know, like Panty and Stalking. Like, that's technically about angels and, like, trying to get into heaven and stuff, but, like, it's not really, like, it's got no Christian themes, when, like, uh, dogmas at, at least, like, about Christianity to an extent. I don't know, I don't really recommend either. I kind of recommend Second Glance just because it's kind of funny. Um, the appointment is better made, but, like, I, it's a lot more dull. I don't know if you guys like, agree. No, I agree. Like, I think a lot made, of the charm like, just, for the appointment kind of loses its luster, like, by the halfway point. And you're just waiting for the ending to happen because, like, that's what you're more interested in. Yeah. Like I said, I was surprised that these movies were, like, better made than I was expecting. But, like, that's kind of, like, the bare minimum a film should be. So, and even, like, in terms of, like, just watching it to, like, make fun of it, we were pretty quiet watching them. I mean, we laughed a so couple of times know, here and there, but... A couple times, but... I don't know, there are other movies that we, are a we lot more fun. We whiffed we riffed a decent amount for, like, second glance, but at the appointment, uh, I was, like, dead silent. I had nothing to say. So, um, so yeah, I guess my, my I, recommendation I don't, is, Yeah, I don't really recommend either. My recommendation is, like, maybe watch second glance, um, but don't watch the other one. They're short. Honestly, the most, interesting, the most interesting part of the appointment to me wasn't even a character. It was the calendar. Because, like we said, this starts on Tuesday, September 11th, but then when we see the calendar again, it's Wednesday the 14th, and that's not... Po what happened to the 12th and 13th? <laughs> was, it a, was it a misprint on the calendar? How do you mess that up? They don't exist. And every time, every time the calendar showed up again, I was laser-focused to make sure, alright, is the date and number, does that line up with what was established? And, and it did. That you think maybe Rich I knew, was. and that's why he had it in his film ten years prior? Maybe. Maybe he predicted maybe. it. Do we have anything else to add about either no. Second Glance or no. The Appointment? I'm, I'm, I'm all done. Alright, uh, I believe it's now Patrick's turn to recommend. Right. So and, what do you got? Uh, uh, I got a real movie for you. <laughs> that that like could mean actual... a lot of things. Yeah, We've been doing this podcast for like three years now, right? I, we started in 2021, I think. February, yep. And uh, we've been doing this for a while. I think it's high time we finally crack the lid open on an Alfred Hitchcock movie. Oh? 
And so for a little background. I was on vacation not too long ago, and a funny incident happened involving a flock of pigeons. And I thought to myself, this seems like something out of the birds. And I'm like, that's a movie I've been wanting to see for a while. That's Alfred Hitchcock. It's a classic. But then I remembered, wait a minute. There's another Alfred Hitchcock movie I already own on DVD that I have been meaning to watch for years. So I think I should probably give that one my attention before the birds. So next up, Rear Window. I've never heard of oh, Rear hell Window. Oh, yeah. I have been meaning to watch this for years. I never have, but I have seen the Simpsons parody of it. I thought you were going to go for Psycho. Yeah, so Patrick, uh, I don't know no. if you remember this, but um, I saw Rear Window in elementary school, and like, there was like a brief period of time where I was like telling people it's like my favorite movie, and, like that. I remember that like threw off my like fourth grade teacher so much. He's like, "Why is this kid? Why is this like eight year old watching Rear Window?" And it was like, "It's cool." But, yeah, no, Rear Window is a great movie, and um, you know, that, that's already my endorsement. You know, an elementary school kid watched it and was entertained. So clearly, it holds up. Now, Rear Window is a movie, like, I've seen the first, like, 30 minutes of it, and I meant to watch the rest the next day, but I just never did, and it's been, like, over 10 years. And I'm like, oh, all right, no. if I recommend it now, I have to give it my attention. Like, no more delays. Yeah. Essentially, you do Rear Window, because, like, if you, did, if you did pick the birds, it'd be, like, you know, it'd be kind of funny, because, like, I haven't seen the birds, so it was like, oh, you know, you recommend... I haven't seen the birds movie. either, but... Yeah, cool. But again, I've been meaning to get to this one for years. I think I should. It's it's time I give it my attention. <laughs> we'll get to yes, the birds uh, at some point. Um. By the way, this is probably just random, but uh, they made a. I don't know if you ever heard of this, but um, they made a Shia LaBeouf remake of this movie. In like two thousand. Yeah, I looked it up. Apparently, there's like one in from nineteen ninety eight. No, this is this is no, the original. From yeah, 1954. No, I'm th what I'm talking about. I think it's called uh, Disturbia. Yeah, in 2007, they made a remake of this movie with Shia LaBeouf. No, this is a great film. Um, arguably one of uh, Hitchcock's um, most significant. It was the first Hitchcock I ever saw. We already talked about Brian De Palma, so this will be. Uh, you know, I guess we'll see the uh, the OG because. Brian De Palma was inspired by Hitchcock heavily. All right. Well, that's going to do it for this episode of It's Always Sunny in Hollywood. Thank you, everybody, for listening in. And, uh, hey, Scotty. Yeah? Jesus, man. <laughs>